Next speaker is uh, Sulu Soare from uh, Senegal. Let's give him a round of applause. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Sulu Soare, and I'm working for the Air Quality Monitoring Center in, uh, in Dakar. Senegal. I'm just going to, to present to you our, our network for air quality monitoring. And here is uh, some presentation with my country. Senegal is located in, in the west and most of Africa, South Asia. Uh, our national spending is 196,072 square kilometers. And our population is estimated by 15.3 million. And we have 46.5% of youth live in the urban uh, area. Uh, the capital city is uh, Dakar and occupies uh, 550 square kilometers, uh, about 0.3% uh, of the country total area. But uh, the concentration north of the economic activity, uh, population of, uh, uh, of Dakar is 2.5 million, and we have uh, 330,125 uh, vehicles, uh, and we have all, all vehicles in the capital city. And about um, about uh, seventy percent of the industrial plant is also in the capital city. Yeah, and on the left you will see uh, Senegal. Senegal is limited by ocean in the west, Atlantic Ocean, and Mauritania in the north, and Mali in the east, and two Guineas on the, the south, the Bissau Guinea and Conakry Guinea. Now. Why uh, our air quality monitoring center justified? Because the Senegalese government being aware of the need to improve the quality of life of people, taking into account man in the impact of air pollution on the human health and the environment. Uh, yeah. The center is funded by Nordic, uh, by, by Nordic development funding and Senegalese government and put under the supervisor of the direction of environmental and classified establishment. The center has six monitoring stations and a reference uh, laboratory. In this reference laboratory, we, we have uh, two servers, uh, the collecting server and the air quality and calculator or modeling uh, server also. Uh, our objective is to keep on watching the ambient air pollution, advocating a real, uh, realistic measurement of improvement air quality to promote the establishment of a committee on air quality to inform the public on air quality and provide report to the authorities for decision making also. Yeah, here is our, our station, our quality management center. Uh, Within the, the framework of the urban mobility improvement program planning, uh, implemented by by city of the Minister of Environment, uh, set up of five station. On the first, we have five station, and uh, the, the the last one is, is beginning on last January. And you see on left, you, you have a mobile laboratory with analyzer is enabled to measure an area not covered by, by the fixed station. And you see uh, we have uh, some API, API device and, and BAM 10, 20 also. And we have uh, some located uh, station here. Yeah. Uh, here is some some pollution we are we are monitoring and the, effort, the sources and some effects we have in the health of our population and the map is the station localization you see the left uh, the right van gateway is the last we, we are we, we are implementing on last January and 
and uh, the table we see this polytan we are measuring is station also and uh, the type of uh, of station because they are urban uh, roadside we are industrial position uh, anyway and when we, we got the data the, in the saver, like uh, XL saver, we calculated the air quality index. And the air quality, we have four types of air quality index. When the, uh, the air quality index is between 0 to 50, we have good air quality. And we give it uh, green, it's in green color. And uh, 51 to 100, uh, moderate yellow color and 101 to 200, unfortunately, unfortunately orange, and more than 200, uh, very unfortunately bad. And on the dry season, we have almost uh, between unfortunately and very unfortunately air index quality, because we have uh, uh, dust, many dust in, in the country. We have one source, uh, natural source, like a desert, Sahara desert. When the winds is directed for, uh, in Dakar or Senegal, we have an episode pollution. Uh, here is uh, the rule for, for calculation, also the, the air quality index, and some regulation of pollutant we have in the, the national and the national uh, regulation we have. The air quality episode that I just give here an example between the two, 22 to 29 December uh, 2017, uh, uh, we, we see uh, we have high pollutant concentration uh, like PM10, maximum value exceeded 800 microgram by, by cubic meters in most of the measurement stations and red, and we have air quality red. This means very unfortunately air quality. Everyone may experience health effects of air pollution. And uh, I say that in the, in the dry season, we have almost the, 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 this period, uh, unfortunately, and we are and us, or very unfortunately, and us. Yeah, it's also the example take photo uh, why the, the, the atmosphere being in, in Senegal and why they, 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 they communicate uh, this, uh, this air quality index to the, the population. Here is uh, the annual mean PM concentration between 2010 to 2015 and 17. Uh, because uh, you, you see PM 10, point, PM 10 annual average, uh, you have almost exceeded WHO regulation and Senegalese regulation. And the PM 2.5, uh, Senegal have not a regulation for this and you use WHO regulation or guideline. And you see we have all. Uh, all of uh, the years we depart largely the, the whole regulation and our own regulation. Yeah. Here is the seasonality for air pollution peak. You see, between um, we have poor air quality during the, the, the dry season, mid November to, to April, and good air quality during the rainy season, May to, to October, because it's raining and the atmosphere is, uh, I can say, clean. Yeah. And you, you have uh, 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 less concentration to yeah. uh, Impact of the traffic and air quality. We see you on uh, when we are between six to, to seven uh, a.m. We are we are we have pollution is growing because uh, the activity is uh, beginning at this time and when we are about um, uh, 2 p.m. and the people are going to home and we have less also concentration of pollutant. And you see our, our model of transport here, Pegaspan and NO2 concentration are absolutely during peak uh, uh, traffic. Yeah. 
uh, here I present in sum of divide because uh, when you see the, the, we are we we are we have a uh, big concentration of, um, of particulate. We buy some device also to to, to monitoring to, to to monitoring also the, the air quality. We have two particulate sample, uh, five portable particulate analyzer and two vehicle pollution measurement device because we need also to, 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 to know what is the path of all sources. Why I, we buy a three vehicle pollution measurement device and two portable melted gas analyzer for emission stuff. And one of VOC measurement device is also for, for emission, industrial emission. And here this is uh, uh, we, we have uh, 15 days, uh, two, two weeks for measurement to characterize particulate because we have a uh, big concentration in our area and we need now what is the composition of this uh, particulate. And you see the, the result and we do it with uh, in this one, one organization in, in France. Yeah, technical partnership, air quality national focal um, point for UNEP and WHO. Uh, CZQI is air quality monitoring center presented at site event on air quality first United Nations environment assembly. And present in the summary report on Senegal air quality policy in, this, in response to resolution. But space, third participation also in the 2000, uh, 2016 Who Global Urban Ambient Air Policy Database and evaluation of health and part of air quality link uh, between pollution episode and respiratory disease and meningitis, local hospital and university powered in the university. And technical partnership also. We have a partnership with CSC in New Delhi. And uh, citizen also, we have a partnership of citizen for monitor reporting and verification in Abidjan and uh, Ivory Coast. This is uh, another country we have on, uh, on West Africa. And uh, the, the CZQR expert will go there to help them to map in Abidjan also. A strategy to regional and international network of, of, for cooperation and research on air quality. Yeah, perspective, Senegal, only one country in West Africa that have a continuous air quality monitoring system. One in system in case of pollution peak to reduce the short term effect on people's health. Extended the monitoring network of the main uh, Senegalese cities by using air sensor needed very well because we have some of cities, big cities inside the country and we never have a uh, station or another, another device there for air quality monitoring. And the population uh, are always asking why we don't go inside, the, the, inside the, the, the country also, because Senegal is not limited to, to the capital city also. And we need very well uh, using the air sensor also inside uh, the, the country and more accurate characterize uh, particularly because it's, uh, it's important for us and today we need also more black carbon and assessment of methane emission also is um, an, an objective for us. Uh, here is the mobility urban program promoted air quality the air and the better project. This is a, a new project for, for um, for regulation also. And here the context of African cities today. We are beginning, we are going up today and we need uh, almost uh, monitoring the air quality. And the context also of is, is Africa. We need to have a data for air quality monitoring because when you see the adult person uh, brief, uh, brief 15 liters uh, air, and we need now what uh, what we are briefing also. 
and our weakness also is African because uh, I listen to them here. And thank you very much for your answer. for that really interesting presentation. Uh, our next speaker is Subu, who uh, the first two speakers were representatives from uh, federal governments in Africa. Subu is an academic and has done a lot of really interesting studies in uh, different parts of the continent. Next up. Uh, thank you all for being here and uh, thanks to Rob for Apologies to Chege who couldn't get a visa. Uh, it kind of sucks that he couldn't be here. So hopefully I'll try to do a good job in this place. Uh, the, so this basically talks about the work that we've been doing for the past year in Rwanda. And uh, uh, my, co my collaborators on this work are uh, Paulina Haramia, who was a, who's a faculty member in engineering and public policy at Carnegie Mellon. And she spent a year at the CMU campus in Kigali, uh, which is now CMU Africa. And while she was there, she said, well, we should do something about the air quality here. There is no air quality monitoring network. And so I went there and uh, put some discretionary parts of money in there and uh, deployed a few ramps, uh, low cost air quality monitors in Kigali. Uh, and uh, of course, postdocs, Carl Mailings, Nathan Williams uh, at Carnegie Mellon. And more, most importantly, the students at the University of Rwanda, uh, 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 Safari, Flavor, Sandrine, and Valerian, who are the first, among the first batch of master's students in atmospheric and climate science at the University of Rwanda. They use the data from these sensors for their master's thesis, and I'll be showing some of those results here. Jimmy Gasur is a faculty member at the University of Rwanda. And so, uh, of course, acknowledgments to the funding that we got from the Dean's Equipment Grant, over twenty grand, twenty thousand dollars for some of the equipment that we bought. Uh, uh, Alan Robinson also provided some uh, support, and Langley do it around the Mogogo Climate Observatory uh, for a couple of years, uh, and she provided some of the data from the black carbon monitors there. Bonfils is a professor at the University of Rwanda as well. He helped mentor the students and other people who have helped us in this research. Uh, and of course, uh, one of the keys, as we are all aware at this point, is that about uh, 1 billion people live in Africa and there's not a whole lot of air quality monitoring. I'm glad to hear that Senegal has air quality monitors and there's other work going on in Ethiopia and Ghana. But obviously, there's lots of places where there's no air quality monitoring. Until, until last year, there wasn't regular air quality monitoring in Kigali, which is where I'm focusing. Uh, the, uh, so these are the two locations where we initially deployed monitors. Uh, the University of Rwanda campus, the College of Science and Technology, is about five kilometers from Gachiriro, which is a residential area. And we picked that area because Paulina was actually staying there and it's easy to put a monitor in her house. Uh, and these are the students, the four students who help uh, maintain the monitors at the University of Rwanda campus. And they all just recently graduated with their master's in atmospheric and climate science. Uh, and we are all going to be working together on writing of these data as a paper soon. And, and in the background, you can see the ramp with a PM monitor and uh, gas sensors, and not shown in the picture as a metal black carbon instrument that we also deployed. Uh, and oh, right. Uh, as Rob asked, what's the success? I think a key here is that we were able to partner with local students who were actually interested in the data and use that to write the thesis. And uh, the monitor at the University of Rwanda campus turned out to be the most reliable data set in our departments there. Uh, so that's a useful thing to note for future such work. Uh, so one of the keys that, so I realized I should have put in a slide about the ramp and what it measures. If you heard my talk yesterday, it's a low-cost air quality monitor that we developed at Carnegie Mellon in partnership with Sensevier. And over the last three years, we have developed the sensor and deployed it in Pittsburgh, about 50 of them in Pittsburgh. And now as in Rwanda, we deployed a few of them as well in Kigali. Uh, so this is about uh, six months of data from April 2017 to September 2017. And one thing that really stands out in the PM 2.5 or fine particle matter data is that there's a very sharp diurnal pattern. Uh, if concentrations go up at night, uh, concert, uh, it's re reasonably clean during the day. And uh, uh, I'll get into why that is in a moment. Uh, 
And so I think the, one of the keys to remember is that a lot of the satellite-based monitors, they give you a snapshot during the day. And so if you have peaks at night, you're not going to be able to capture those peaks. And so one idea is to actually deploy these low-cost PM monitors on the ground and use that to complement the satellite-based monitors, which, which are obviously useful to get large coverage. Um, so this is a box and whisker plot showing the data over those same six months. And you can see the significant diurnal variation, but overall concentrations are about 20 to 40 microns per meter cube uh, across the six months. And obviously, there are some outlier points that go up to 60 to 80 microns per meter cube. And uh, the wet season concentrations are lower than the dry season concentrations. And you can see that the background or the minima that you measure in PM2.5 increases during the dry season, which suggests that during the rainy season, as a previous speaker pointed out, there is some rain out of uh, transported pollution. And so there's more local pollution, but during the dry season, you get transport from background, other sources, uh, dust, for example, and that increases your overall PM levels in Rwanda as well during the dry season. And uh, if you compare, so I looked at some data from the GeoSchem uh, global model, uh, thanks to Alois Marais at the University of Birmingham. And uh, what we find is that those median values underestimate our observations, uh, sometimes significantly. And perhaps as expected, because global models tend to um, better reflect uh, averages over you know, 36 kilometer by 36 kilometers, so very outside of a city. So in an urban area where you have higher emissions, and if you don't have a right emission inventory, you basically could uh, significantly underestimate the PM in those cities. And so one, uh, another idea is to actually use these low-cost sensors to verify and tune your emission inventories. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to point out was, uh, I was showing this data, or discussing these data with Eloise, and she said that her emission inventories don't have a dynamic pattern, and we actually observed that with our data. So that is one way to um, fine tune your models as well. And so this is, was an interesting experiment that uh, uh, happened. So in Kigali, you actually have this, the first Sunday of every month is a car-free Sunday. And so it goes up to about noon of the day, and then after that, cars can go, uh, you can drive your cars as usual. And uh, Safari uh, did, did this analysis where he compared the PM uh, dial profile from normal Sundays, which is in the orange, with the, with the car-free Sundays, which is in the green and blue. And you can see a sharp difference in those patterns. And this is data from, uh, I believe, uh, July of 2017 to about December of 2017. And uh, it, that suggests that in the mornings, uh, there is a significant influence from rush hour traffic potentially, even on a Sunday. And uh, so this is you know, one potential idea for uh, pollution control. And so you, again, this speaks to, you can use low-cost sensors to sort of look at these effects of pollution control policies and optimize them and verify their performance as well. And of course, the other thing you can notice is that at, in the evening, once the car free, the, 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 the I don't want to see the ban on cars is lifted, pollution levels come back to normal uh, as every other Sunday. So I think that's a pretty cool result that we got. Uh, the other work, uh, so Sandrine Guherba, uh, she was also a master's student and she looked at the black carbon data from Mugogo and from Kigali. Mugogo is where MIT has their, had their global atmospheric watch station. And uh, the black carbon, the, the data shown here is monthly averages of black carbon uh, 2 PM 2.5 and the MET-1 black carbon instrument that we use measures uh, absorption at 10 wavelengths. So we look at the black carbon, equivalent black carbon concentration at 370 nanometers, which is the ultraviolet, near, near UV and 880 nanometers, which is infrared. So the black carbon at 880 better reflects black carbon by itself. And the black carbon at three, equivalent black carbon at 370, uh, if it is higher than the black carbon at 880, that suggests that there is brown carbon or biomass burning or wood for, uh, biofuel influence. Uh, the first thing that you can see is that the, the ratio of black carbon to PN2.5 seems relatively high, anywhere from like 15% to about 21%. And uh, it's basically in the dry season, it's lower and in the wet season, number is the wettest season with highest rainfall. And that's when it's highest. And that suggests that in the rainy season, you basically have uh, a, a reduction in the background, for example. So your pollution is dominated by local combustion sources in the city. 
and so your black carbon to PM concentrations, uh, PM ratio increases in November. Uh, the other thing, obviously, is that uh, your black carbon at 370 is significantly higher than the black carbon at 880, assuming these wavelength dependencies hold up. That suggests that that is also, in addition, previously we saw that there is significant contribution from molecular sources, but here that could be cook stove emissions, biofuel burning, charcoal emissions, forest fires that could be contributing significant amounts of black carbon and brown carbon as well. Uh, and so with the ramps, you can actually get some gas data. We haven't processed it fully, uh, mainly because we don't have a reference monitor as the previous speakers alluded to, not having a reference monitor at these sites. It's hard to uh, calibrate in uh, your low cost sensors, but the carbon monoxide detector is relatively reliable and robust and you see pretty high concentrations up to about two ppm. So those levels, uh, we feel confident in that data. And you can see that a higher black carbon and higher um, in 2.5, you also see the red colors in the carbon monoxide, and so higher carbon monoxide, higher black carbon, higher in 2.5 again, uh, says there's lots of primary uh, combustion sources that are contributing to p 2.5 in Kigali. Uh, and so the combination of the low-cost sensors, the PM monitor, and the black carbon monitor can tell us a lot about the source contributions to a city. So uh, the one thing that I didn't say is that we are using some of this data to run a simple box model and see whether we can actually estimate emissions using a box model and emissions inventory that's work in progress. Uh, the uh, other interesting work that we looked at, Sandrine did, she looked at diurnal profiles, uh, both in Kigali as well as Musanze, which is the rural area, which is the climate observatory. And uh, you can actually see that at Muzanze, the diurnal profile is pretty flat, whether it's in the dry season or the wet season. Whereas in Kigali, you can see a nice uh, uh, rush hour peak as well as, in the, uh, as well as in the afternoon rush hour peak. And so that again uh, says your vehicular emissions are higher in the city and they do contribute to your black carbon in the city. Uh, the other factor to think about is that at Musanze, you might have more biofuel emissions, you don't have as much vehicular in such a diagonal profile, people going to work in the morning and coming back, they have a different activity pattern. And uh, the, the dry season black carbon in Musanze is significantly higher than the wet season, which is just, that could be forest fires that are impacting the, the rural areas in the dry season and not so much in the wet season. Uh, so I've got about three minutes, I'm gonna talk about a little bit about the work that we did in Tanzania. Uh, this, we went to rural Tanzania. This is a team of Origin employees and Nathan Williams, the postdoc. Uh, and he, they were looking at solar microgrids in rural Tanzania, where there is no electricity, no running water. And so we tried to do some air quality measurements there. And so we actually took a MET1 Aeroset 831, which is a portable battery operated monitor that uses some size distributions, PM1, PM2.5, PM10. And so I basically just walked around the village and placed it in different areas over 10 minutes at a time and did an average of the concentrations. And we did that for two or three days in, in both uh, Murasagamba and Bugarama, those two villages that we visited. And uh, so this is the kitchen, obviously, I think as, one, as someone mentioned, indoor uh, uh, PM levels are significantly higher because you're cooking with, uh, with your regular three stone fires, uh, the classic one, and we put the uh, aerosol there and we recorded the highest values, about 400 microns per meter cube of PM10 and about 200 microns per meter cube of PM2.5 inside. So there are children and women sitting in there and they're all breathing out of the smoke. Uh, so that's obviously a big indoor problem and obviously there have been lots of efforts to do clean cook stoves that haven't really gone anywhere for all sorts of reasons. That's a different story. But focusing on the ambient outdoor measurements, you still do see high concentrations. The orange bars are PM2.5 and the blue bars are PM10. And these are data as reported by the aeroset. So not calibrated, but they seem to work reasonably well. And uh, you can actually see that even outdoors, you can get concentrations of up to about 40 to 60 microns per meter cube of PM2.5. And this is in a rural, unelectrified area of Tanzania, not an urban area. And that's Bugarama, uh, which is a smaller village than Murasagamba, and that actually has higher concentrations of PM2.5 and PM10. Uh, happy to give you the slides, Darby. <laughs> uh, the, uh, and so, 
obviously there are issues with it. Aerosol scientists know there are chemical composition, size distribution, and all that that we need to look at. Uh, but uh, but I think the key was that in these rural areas, you do see high concentrations of PM2.5. Uh, to summarize, uh, you see a significant dial pattern in urban Kigali, which you don't see in rural Musanze. Uh, the models may underestimate the urban PM2.5 in Rwanda and other cities. Uh, a few other things, the challenges, the data communication was spotty. Uh, we were super, really helped by the students there. Uh, funding was significantly a big problem. You can see my grant there, my ample free time that paid for it. And uh, But obviously there's some funding there. And speaking of funding, I just want to note that I'll be going to France. Uh, the French government has actually funded uh, me to study at already in Paris as well as in, I'm well over time, but you can read that slide. Uh, but uh, I've, and as the previous speaker alluded, we want partnerships and hopefully we can work together with uh, uh, people in West Africa as well to expand some of these low cost monitors. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, you went for that interesting uh, talk. Our next speaker is Sean Khan from the Environment. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I had so much to say and was challenged to, the one thing at the UN we do well is talk. Um, so I was really challenged to cram this down into a short period of time. So let's hope it's, 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 it's uh, coherent. So what I'm gonna attempt to do is give you an outline of the rationale uh, behind the approach uh, we're taking in low and middle income countries. And then um, as part of that rationale, the approach we took is, is to sensors one on one, just our dive into this whole uh, well, landscape um, where we, we attempted to develop, or what we have successfully done, a, an open source uh, sensor device. Um, I will focus around. Uh, what we've done for low and middle income countries using Nairobi as a proxy, it's as our sandbox because that's where we're headquartered. Um, and then touch a little bit on this, what I call the network thingy, because as we get more and more sensors and some of the speakers uh, yesterday uh, alluded to this, um, it's a different landscape with all this data coming in and what you do with it. Um, it can be overwhelming. Then I sum up with some lessons. So this is our rationale, and uh, previous speakers sort of touched on this eloquently. Um, huge data gap. Uh, this is from the Global Atmospheric Watch. And we've been in partnership with them uh, for decades. And this picture has improved in, in, in developed countries, but in, in Africa, parts of Asia, Latin America, it's pretty much the same. Um, th this map, I think, is from 2013. There's a newer one, but it's more messy because it includes all of these stations that uh, are no longer functioning. But this makes the point. Now, what we are hoping to do, um, and those are indicated by the green and yellow stars, um, is deploy with, in close collaboration with uh, federal and, and, and local authorities um, a program to validate the use of, of um, low-cost sensors, and uh, my colleagues from Senegal and, and, and Ghana alluded to this too. So they're in, in, in the plan uh, for the rest of this year and, and next year to do co-location studies and to first establish if the, the data that these devices produce is good enough for the particular need of the country, and that varies from country to country. So. Here's our, our 101 on monitoring. We got all excited about this. Uh, Priyank is over here uh, in the room. She, she was a predecessor helping on some of this work. And we commissioned uh, work to develop a prototype. We got all excited. And our narrative back in 2014 was, hey, this thing is a replacement for, uh, for, for regulatory monitors. So instead of paying 150,000, you can pay $1,500 and you get this. And we were really wrong. But, but, we developed a prototype uh, with the help of the EPA that was tested. Um, and, and the findings of those tests led to uh, an independent evolution of it uh, based on the reference design from a company called South Coast Science. So now we've got a success in the sense that um, a commercial entity has picked this up and now produces um, an open source version of, of a device that is much better engineered and cleaner. And those are the two pictures shown here. 
Um, some of the things we learned, well, one, it's not a replacement, but maybe a, a complement to regulatory instruments, um, but it's easy to deploy. And this is a big one, and I'll show you some of the cases of, of where we've had to leverage that advantage of sensors. So here's what we started out with uh, in 2016. Now, we haven't been long in this business in monitoring, yes, for decades, but in monitoring using low-cost sensors, we sort of got into this just recently. And so we took a number of devices and installed them around Nairobi, um, background, industrial, uh, residential, and so on. And voila, very quickly, you, you get data coming out. And, and then we had to make sense of what it is. And so with the help of, of, of academia, um, Cambridge University, uh, Professor Rodney Jones, who's, who's is around, um, we started to use the initial data sets to work with, the, with the, um, the local government to show them what you can do. And so very quickly, we can start to show things like there are multiple sources of pollution. And this is for one of the sites um, that we installed. And then we can show, well, hey, um, for all the pollutants, there's some commonality here in terms of where it's coming from, um, and so on and so forth, and, and make the connection between transport and pollution that you're seeing. And so this has been a very useful tool in terms of getting um, acceptance for the use of the technology, um, not for regulatory purposes as yet, but really in terms of, of getting the conversation going, in terms of how we can scale this, in terms of how the county can use this um, to generate revenue in terms of fines and so on. Uh, here's another example of, of, of the data where you can definitely see patterns. Uh, we've seen this throughout the week so far. Uh, Sundays are quiet days, so pollution is down, rush hour and so on and so forth. Here's another example where we have Again, done the modeling. Uh, now, when we were doing this, this is all done manually. And so some of the work that uh, uh, Rick Peltier has done is, has, has made this a web-based service where we can pump this data into here and produce it. So more and more we get to a point which is exciting because when you think of how we can scale this and the sort of support and capacity building needs that, are, are, that have to, to make this a success, uh, the automation of, of a lot of the analysis that we have when we, when these slides are produced, were done manually, can now be done on a web-based platform. And so here you see uh, PM 2.5 uh, scaled individually, and then PM 2.5 scaled across all the nodes. And what pops out there, the, the lower two maps plots. Uh, one, the one in the lower middle is Kibera, which is an informal settlement. And the other one is a school right near the uh, industrial setting. So you start to see different patterns and so on. And this is what we use to engage um, with the local authorities into how we can scale this up. Another thing we've done um, is now going down, so that's all at the federal level, going down to the county level is working with uh, UN Habitat, who um, really are concerned about better urban planning um, to mitigate um, pollution uh, and help with, with or, you know, general development um, is coordinated in a coordinated effort with the county is close a section of the central business district. And we usually would do that on a Friday to a Sunday, so we're not too disruptive. But install a sensor very easily against a, a building or a street po uh, light post, um, collect some data before the event, close the, the, the street, that's the middle, the middle bullet plot, and then reopen it after. Um, as a tool. And what we do is, is not just do that by itself, but focus it around an advocacy event. And here you see where our colleagues from UN Habitat engage with street vendors, uh, young people uh, to communicate concepts like cycle lanes and, and, and pedestrian walkways, all absent um, from, and, uh, from, from urban plan and execution in some of these, these areas. Another one we did then build on that just more recently uh, is in a different county. And so I'm talking about county here. And here it's the, the county government, the mayor, deputy mayor are a lot more accessible. And so one of the strategies we're employing amongst many is, is to do these, these small pilots at, at, a, at a micro scale, let's say. 
um, to sort of stimulate, in a way, in-country um, examples that others will, will copy. So here we got another example where in a similar street in a different county, we've done the same thing. But two um, locations, 120 meters apart, um, and about 180 meters from, the, from ma a major highway. So relatively close together. But what you see here is some really contrasting um, data. In, on one of the sites, very close by, it's relatively clean. And the one where we had the event, it's, it's quite noisy in terms of pollution. So why is that? Well, we've used the clarity uh, nodes for several reasons. One is it's really simple to deploy. It's solar powered. And trying to run uh, a 220 volt connection on an electricity post or on a uh, mobile phone uh, mass is, is quite a, an obstacle. So having something you can just screw into the, the post or, or you know, so attached to a frame makes life very easy. But what this demonstrates is several things. Another strategy where we're looking at how to, to sustain and scale these interventions. So on the right-hand side, um, you see a mobile phone mass, and that's an experiment we're doing with the local phone company um, to get them to buy into the idea of monitoring. And the notion here is they address a number of issues we face. Um, that you may not have here in the West. One is security, uh, communication, uh, supply of power, that sort of basic thing. In fact, most of the challenges we face are less to do with the sensor itself and more to get the thing up and running and keep it and, and have it remain running. Uh, so, so here's an experiment where we got an agreement with Safaricom, which is one of the biggest um, mobile phone companies, uh, certainly in Kenya, to look into this idea of if they were to install a sensor in every one of their base stations, we'd have quite a dense sensor network. And the idea that they can use this approach to um, generate revenue, you know, to produce subscriber services, and even sell some of that back to the local authorities for analysis hotspot. Uh, identification and so on. But going back to the story of why the plots look so different, what you'll see here is where we put the sensor, it's surrounded by big buildings, so we actually have to climb up higher in the mass to try to get a better uh, vantage point, but still we're not sure. One of the things we did before deploying was to run the two devices side by side to just make sure that they are performing pretty much uh, in tandem. And the, the, the blue spikes at the end is, is what happens when you put one of these in a backpack and go off to deploy it, so ignore that. And the other thing we did recently is start to look at the off-peak sections midnight to see, again, are these devices correlated? So we're still not sure, there's more, more to be um, examined here. And this is, why, this is what's going to lead me into this whole issue of the data. And you imagine we're talking uh, six sensors, and I'm giving an example of one in a, on, a, on, a, on a street uh, for the place making, but what if you have a thousand of these with issues that, some of the issues I'm showing you here, what do we do? So one of the exciting parts of, of what we're learning about of video and the strategies we constantly adjust and try to optimize is to look at tools like here now um, and see how we can use that to ease the burden both in terms of management and support the countries uh, in terms of, of uh, taking up this technology and managing data, whether it's sensor data or regulatory data. And here you can see an example where within the system you can define your quality control and quality assurance uh, rules. So if the device is stuck for X number of minutes or hours, flag it. If the device exceeds a threshold or doesn't exceed a, a norm, flag it. And so we can, we can use this sort of, uh, I'm gonna say automation, for lack of a better word, to, to manage large amounts of installations um, at a country or a city level. And so this is the direction we're going to go in, in terms of rolling out a program to support countries, uh, both in the uptake of sensor technology, but also to sort of move in the direction of, of open data. A lot of information is, is available, not much of it is shared in the continent. Uh, so what have we learned? 
So definitely there's a, uh, and I failed to mention this earlier, one of the things we did right at the onset uh, was write to our member states to say, hey, we're thinking about this uh, use of sensors, who'd like to pilot it with us? And we got an overwhelming response. We, we actually haven't been able to, to, to then fill, fill that, that need. Uh, but we're getting there. So there's definitely a need. Um, there's definitely interest. One of the, the striking differences we've taken here is, is the use of sensors here. We're going, are engaging with local authorities rather than communities, NGOs, um, and, and universities, although they're all part of the conversation. So we rely on them. Um, the data, as I've shown, is sufficient to draw conclusions to help uh, hopefully get a conversation going in terms of how polluter uh, pays or uh, principles to be implemented, uh, traffic demand management, uh, urban planning and zoning can be informed. And one of the key things we've learned is deployment or redeployment is really simple with this because if you pick a spot, like possibly the safari com example on the, on the mass, which may not be the best sited location, it's very easy to climb up, take it down and put it somewhere else, especially if it's solar powered. And finally, the whole cloud-based management approach um, is a direction that's exciting for us. Um, it'll achieve a number of agendas in terms of filling that gap across the, um, the continent and into other regions um, beyond Africa, because the, the gap is not just in Africa, it's in many places. But it'll also see that this whole collective effort in terms of support and learning from each other. Thank you very much. John. Uh, so we have now a little bit of a change in the program. Uh, as I mentioned earlier at the beginning of, uh, we weren't here for the very beginning of the um, this session. The uh, uh, in yesterday there was a talk scheduled by Lu Faoshan, who is the deputy director of the Beijing Municipal Environmental Monitoring Session or Environmental Monitoring Monitoring Center. Uh, because of travel delays and coming from so far, he wasn't able to make it to the session yesterday. So instead, we're uh, going to hand the platform over to him to give his presentation uh, now. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Liu Baoxian. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Liu Boxian from Beijing Municipal Environmental Monitoring Center, China. I'm very glad to have this opportunity to share my work with you at this, at this meeting. Today, my report is divided to into three parts, including Beijing's I call the status, Beijing's I call the monitoring, monitoring and the high distance sensor monitoring network. In May 2016, the United Nations Environmental Program released the Beijing's eye pollution control process during 1998 to 2013. While cutting that the eye quality has been effectively improved along with the uh, rap, uh, rapid development of Beijing. Mr. Achim Stender, also pointed out that in front of huge challenges, Beijing has successfully improved its eye quality when maintaining the high speed development. In recent five years, Beijing's eye quality has been greatly, great, greatly improved from 2013 to 2017. PM2.5 has, has, has depart, departed from 90 to, to 15A with a decrease of 35.6% and other persons also very obvious. This is a map of Beijing's eye quality levels in recent five years. The dark, the dark color, the higher the blue level. It can still be seen, seen from the map side. In recent years, the number of days with eye up to standard has increased year by year, and the number, and the number of days with heavy pollution has decreased year by year. For example, 23 heavy pollution days in 2017, uh, and uh, 16 days less than 2015, and uh, 
30, and 35 days less than uh, 2030. At 4 p.m. 2.5, it can show from a uh, uh, calendar finger that the improvement in, five, in recent five years is also particularly obvious. The top is 2013, and the bottom one is 2017. In 2017, the high pollution was, was basically uh, eliminated from March to September. Next stage is I call the monitoring. The biomonitoring bio results are all from the iMonitoring network. In 2015, Beijing once, once again uh, upgraded the iQuality monitoring network and uh, built the three uh, 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 dimensional, dimensional monitoring network as shown in the following figure. Uh, Exemplary uh, example the high decimal sensor monitoring network was uh, applied. Uh, applied uh, uh, what uh, uh, network? We apply this uh, technology to large scale monitoring, monitoring of eye quality in Beijing for the first time, and we totally one thousand uh, uh, five hundred point location, and uh, the data will be sent out every five minutes. The mon the monitoring network mainly mainly use the PM two point two point five small sensors and. Uh, Adopt advanced uh, technologies, uh, technologies such as Internet of Things, cognitive, cognitive computing, computing, big, big data analysis, and uh, cloud servers. In the in the, film, in the building, I will based on the kinds of this sec section. In terms of layout of uh, point location, we divided the RBL of Beijing into grades of three kilometer times three kilometer and the mountain, mountain air of eight kilometer uh, times eight kilometer. And a small sensor of PM2.5 is like in each grade. Before the layout, uh, multiple, multiple palace uh, comp uh, comparison and uh, uh, comparison with uh, a standard uh, state uh, uh, accuracy of each sensor will be made. And the uh, compress comparison uh, will cover the uh, main pollution uh, contrasting rate, uh, like this, like this time, this time uh, contain the high pollution and the low, uh, low, uh, low pollution. QA and QC as a box of my research work. Before the instant lesson, we need, we need to carry out a strict uh, collaboration work. And uh, after, uh, after instant lesson, we use cloud, cloud quality control model to transfer the quality of the standard state to the small sensor. At, pre at, at present, uh, at the present, our high uh, test uh, sensor network is mainly used in following several aspects. The first is to achieve uh, PM2.5 uh, concentration, no, uh, no ability at any point. The second is to carry out the are the uh, typification of high value of pollution in center air. Uh, the second is understand the pollution formation and, uh, and the description press uh, dynamically. In the field, we will also use the network to provide uh, real-time air quality information based on the question of parts. And also, we will uh, construct the uh, urban three uh, dimensional uh, eye quality uh, dynamic uh, monitoring model uh, combined with other data. Now, this is my today report. Thank you, attention. Uh, the, the last, the next, uh, I have a video for my work about the sensor. Uh, please, uh, uh, please play. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you. 
General Secretary Xi suggested city management should be very delicate. Beijing, with a size of over 16,000 square kilometers, carrying more than 21 million residents. For this megacity, it is essential to rely on technology for achieving delicacy management. Since 2015, Beijing started to upgrade the air quality monitoring network, set up 1,500 PM 2.5 monitoring points, divided Beijing into three three-kilometer grids and established high-density grid monitoring system. The system automatically identify high emission periods and areas and notify law enforcement officials timely. This strongly supports air quality management. By scientific innovation, we developed low-cost sensors independently, explored new network layout, and developed network operation and QAQC modes. These provide solid foundation for accurate air quality data. By big data analysis, the satellite data, climate data, air quality monitoring data, and pollution source information are well integrated. We comprehensively consider industry hotspots, pollution level, the amount of pollutants and categories of pollutants. We track and identify local grid with higher PM2.5 emission. With the network, we can realize timely identification and alerting of high pollution and the comparison of concentration to locate the high emission areas. The application of PM2.5 high density grid monitoring network, realizing all time and whole city accurate air quality monitoring and display from urban to rural, from community to village. Beijing will carry out assessments for air quality in each community and town and promote pollution control. The bigger role is in law enforcement. From August 2017, Beijing creatively combined the results of PM2.5 high density grid monitoring network with the existing grid environmental law enforcement system and developed the hotspot grid regulation platform. From the whole city, the highly polluting grid is detected and the enforcement officials will be notified on real time. The efficiency of law enforcement is improved. During the August to December 2017, relying on the technical support of PM2.5 high density grid monitoring network, Beijing has found and failed penalties to 1,151 violations with penalties over 33 million RMB increasing 90.5 and 95.6% comparing with 2016. On Beijing International Forum of Metropolitan Clean Air Action and the Forum of Science, Policy and Business hosted by UN Environment, Beijing introduced the setup and operation experience of PM2.5 High Density Grid Monitoring Network and shared Beijing experience in air pollution control. Okay, and, and also, I think some uh, post about uh, 20 years of fighting eye pollution in Beijing. If you, if anyone uh, interested, you can get, get it uh, through me. Okay, thank you. That's all. So now we're going to move to the panel discussion part of our uh, program, but um, in trying to be flexible and uh, uh, accommodate, um, we're going to mainly structure the program for the four speakers we had originally, and then if folks would like to uh, um, speak with Mr. Liu about his presentation, we'd love for you to talk with him, but uh, maybe we're going to first start with questions for the four panelists uh, that we originally we began with in the beginning. And uh, I want to make sure there's plenty of time for you to speak with Mr. Liu. So um, are you planning to be here uh, 
for the rest of the session today? Like, uh, are you available? Um, yes, okay. So uh, uh, folks, make sure you uh, flag him down. And uh, maybe it'd be easier if you, do you think it'd be easier if you uh, had discussion outside about the, 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 those, those topics? Maybe what we'll do is this. We'll take questions for our, uh, our main panel for a little while, and then we'll have questions uh, about the, um, the Beijing presentation. Um, so with that in mind, uh, we can first begin with um, questions for our main panel. And uh, Kristen, did you have a question or do you have a suggestion? Okay. No, I have a question. Yes, thank you for presenting and being here with us today. I'm Kristen Benedict with US EPA. I was wondering, um, in your countries, how important the citizens view air quality versus other priorities, and if there's sort of a cry for action at the citizen level? Does anyone want to take a first shot at that? I was really inspired by uh, Salu's presentation about the air quality index. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that and, and how the air quality index has uh, um, motivated people in Senegal. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, um, air quality situation in, in, in Ghana has been extensively um, actually uh, we communicated to the um, citizens, but not much. Um, initially, what we were doing is to give them the air quality index, which was not regular. And then we we're doing this mainly targeting dedicated foods. But with now, we've now come out with air quality management communication plan, which actually has categorized the audience. We now have audience for the um, target groups for the political folks. We have a target group for, it's also targeted to the semi and illiterate group, and then the academia, and then among others. So in Ghana, the information hasn't gone much. Aside the little complaints that people normally make as a result of open burning, because it's very, very close to them and they tend to react quickly. But as to the health benefits and among others, we need to do more to, to be able to achieve, achieve that. That's why, in our communication plan, we've made it to target various groups so that different information. Uh, based on the assimilation capacity of the people can, can be used for them to be able to understand what, what it is. So that's what we're planning to do um, with the continuous monitors. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. We in, uh, in Senegal today, we have a six monitoring session uh, in the capital city, one of the, 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 the six stations is on the suburb, uh, and another department on the, the, the Dakar region. And we need to, to more, more information for the, the, the air quality information because in this five, uh, six station is not enough for all uh, the region of the region of Dakar like another department named it picking there are many people and so and the traffic is jam and we need also to to, to know the air quality uh, in this uh, area also and uh, what kind of uh, thing we, we need uh, or we think is a mobile laboratory we have a mobile laboratory this mobile laboratory help us to to search or to monitoring uh, the area without the, the fixed station, and also there are the new uh, uh, the new industrial area also in Dakar. Uh, 
and we need to, to know also the air quality in this side also. And we need also to, uh, to, 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 to know what is the, the, the path of its sources of the air pollutant in Dakar. Yes. Uh, I think uh, we have a um, collaboration with uh, UNAM. Maybe we have air sensor and to deploy all all the air sensor in in the, the the region or in the country. And and there are today the the students also at the university they are making the they are searching for air quality and another side also like uh, the region uh, who is uh, who is the front of in in that kind of part. yeah because uh, inside the country also there are some of cities there are many people and some act economic activities and we need also to, to monitoring all these uh, cities and to inform population and and we have collaboration for some of the hospitals uh, we are working for the, the brief uh, uh, malaria yeah? and they give also information and we send us our data for correlation of also for the, the the impact of air quality pollution. Thank you. I think I answer for your question. Yeah, sure. Well, yeah. One, to, to, to the question, one of the things from where I said we observed were when we reached out to member states to say who's interested in piloting this with us, we got a variety of, of um, and we qualified that interest, we got a variety of responses. And in some cases uh, in Africa, and parts of Latin America, it was because of public outcry, and um, the, the, the city, the county didn't have any sort of monitoring in place, so they were under pressure to respond to newspaper articles. Indeed, um, the, the, the citizens' awareness is growing, and then the pressure on government to, to, um, to, to defend that or, or support, support and do something about it is there. And so, to ask the question, how how did they determine? In some cases, we found in the formal settlements in the evenings. And so the, the local authorities says they have no monitoring instruments. So how can they make this claim? Um, and then we, we, with uh, to our partners, we discovered well, in one case, in the formal settlement in the evenings, they removed all their clothing off the clotheslines. Okay, first thing that comes to mind is someone's going to steal. Said no, 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 not at all. Because in the morning we'll be all black because of, of all the discharges in the night. So, and so this is our evidence. And so these were some of the motivations and the, the sort of requirements or needs that we documented. Some of these countries came to us and said, "Yes, we need to find Are there any questions for the panel? If you have a question, you can come up to the microphone and then please introduce yourself and uh, post us your name and your affiliation. Um, I'm uh, Jalal. I'm a policy student uh, at the RAN Graduate School. Um, we're we are deploying, uh, we're uh, considering low cost sensors for deployment in Santa Monica um, area and uh, to, to get a hyper localized uh, um, assessment of the area. My question is uh, in your experience, um, you, you mentioned. Uh, as a deployed purple layer and clarity noise sensors. Uh, how, uh, how has your experience in terms of uh, the comparison with the government uh, method uh, been? Um, I'd, I'd like to, uh, to have your comments on uh, the impact of, of uh, temperature. Obviously, you, you mentioned that during the summer there were peaks. Uh, uh, so, how, how, uh, how do you? Compare that against uh, FRM, and if, if um, um, those peaks were were actual peaks, or were they uh, was is 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 there a requirement for temperature uh, compensation in, in in those senses? Basically, in short, like how has your experience uh, been with with purple air sensors and clarity node? Uh, those those are 
some of the low cost sensors that you can see. Thank you. For the clarity notes and the purple and we deployed them just last month. So um, when we did the co-location um, at EP head office, we realized that they were actually working perfectly and they were comparable. We deployed them to our existing monitors, monitoring stations. And as you were told this morning, uh, we don't have the continuous monitors. We have the six day monitoring uh, regime, which involves the use of total papers, the government method. So uh, comparing them with those, those systems will, will be very, very difficult. What we intend doing is that we're going to have two standard uh, monitoring equipment from World Bank and they will be deployed by the end of this year. If we receive them, we will do co-location with those sensors. Uh, with the standard ones and then look at the performance of the sensors before we can roll it on to other areas where we don't have the sensors at all or monitoring. We have not yet downloaded the data. The data is on plug base, going to US, Sonoma technology. So we are having a discussion next week on the data and see how the data look like. As of now, I have not seen the data for the three week to one month monitoring. We need to have the data and see how it's. it's is effective than performance of each equipment. So that's what I can see about that. We've not done a comparison of the monitoring with standard ones because we don't even have the standards in place. Standard monitors in place, the continuous monitors. We only have a gap metric system. So, uh, I can I actually quickly add to that. So, given, so I'm from, uh, we're doing a lot of work in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, as you said, Hawaii, and California. And so, uh, well, uh, you're going to come to my talk yesterday in the data analytics session, but shoot me an email. We just had about 30 purple air monitors, uh, 50 in Mecca, and they were PM monitors in Pittsburgh. I think generally the purple is pretty robust. Uh, I think uh, I think we have had developed some corrections for them for humidity and temperature, uh, and uh, you know the data is pretty accessible on the purple air map. So and unless you mark it as private, which I believe is what happened, uh, but uh, in that case, but uh, I think the purple air is a reasonably robust. We can also talk to maybe some of the South Coast AQMB folks here who are developing like 400 purple air monitors across California. They have a lot more experience than that. You can go to the Infospec website. Just plug for our sponsors. And I'll add that I hear a lot of uh, these kind of intercomparisons that have been done or are being done. And so I think there's the development of a very sort of robust uh, data set. And I think having the Ghana data as part of that will be really valuable to be able to see how to, under you know conditions that are quite different than Pittsburgh or Santa Monica, uh, how, how are these sensors comparing to um, uh, to federal reference metrics? Do we have any other questions? I'm Kate Weber from the U.S. Department of State. Um, so you talked about some of the particular challenges to deploying these sensors in Africa power security issues. Um, could you talk a little bit about, as you look toward longer term deployment, some of the other potential maintenance capacity challenges? I understand that those can be issues in, in some countries as well. So when, when we look back in time, the traditional approach was uh, sort of concluded that that was not sustainable because of just a, a huge um, funding burden in terms of capacity needs and then maintenance costs. And so that's why we embarked on the low cost side. 
So the flip side to that is yes, it's, it's cheaper to acquire one, but now we're talking about you know, 100 plus sensors. Uh, it's still cheaper, I think. What I think we, and part of the strategy that we're we're employing, I think what will help us is um, the cloud-based approach, where the the, the the use of software um, could help ease the burden of maintenance in terms of identifying what is drifting, when it's drifting, what's invalid, what's invalid, and so on. And then leveraging that same sort of platform would ease uh, our obligation to member states in terms of being able to build their capacity because we're all talking about the same platform. So that, that's what we're betting on um, going forward in terms of supporting countries to take up the technology and then scale it. Um, and then the third element of that is, is the experiment I sort of alluded, alluded to with, with the private sector, where we're looking, in the example I gave, to the Safari Club, the mobile phone company, to take all that and generate revenue from it so that we can feed back into it. And we do an habitat, all the schemes of taxation, where um, the, the local authorities can, can generate revenue through parking fees. And that's the policy side of things where we'd like to take the conversation to then sustain and enhance um, the network. Thank you for local capacity. Uh, I, we, we can, today we can uh, maintenance the equipment analyzer, all the analyzers. I am in charge for the maintenance today. But for the fifth station, we have uh, some problem because we have not enough budget for for the equipment for maintenance equipment uh, and for the air quality monitoring center. We need always for the, the another aspect to audit you or to do uh, some three maintenance. Yeah, you need it, and when you see today to our countries, we have many many of projects for development projects, and sometimes they don't uh, they don't uh, recognize for the air quality monitoring uh, center. You see, and and today we are the focal point for who, for example and who collect many information for the air quality in West Africa or on, on the world, and they, they, they diffuse information. I know on last, uh, last July, they classified Dakar to the second question on the world, and discuss all this uh, on the, the media, you know, and they define our, our opinion. Because Dhaka is not the second uh, city or the second city or town is most polluted, no? But you know uh, the inconvenience of air sensors sometimes in our country. There are many today in Senegal the air sensor, but some of them they 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 don't they estimate the the the, the, the pollutant concentration. They don't give you a good concentration for the air. This is inconvenient for air sensor, but for the fixed seed, the inconvenient is uh, the maintenance. The maintenance is very, very expensive. Today, I, am, I, I have some, some near experience for the maintenance. Um, I can do well this time today. Thank you. I think the very I'll add on to what he said. I'll try not to repeat what he has said. <laughs> um, maintenance costs, running of monitoring is very expensive. And for where we are coming from, budget constraints is a very big limiting factor. We normally don't have government backing or budget because the government also has some uh, social and economic uh, issues that they have to address in terms of running the, the economy. And with a limited budget, 
There's always a tendency that let's certify the very important ones that can easily allow them to win power in the next election. Here we'll be looking at education, looking at health, but putting on the background research and those things will come down. And monetary money are not to be created. And also be looking at how can we repay the workers. So that's the main challenge that normally that happens. Uh, this vote aside, um, my institution like this was very lucky because uh, of the power that was given to us as a mandate that we can collaborate with local uh, stakeholders as well as our international partners. And that is what really has really helped us now. Because uh, local, we try to build capacity of our other uh, local partners, and they also take it up also with their budgets. And then what we also get because we have the National Environment Fund. And of course, this fund is only EPA Ghana that contributes into it through the permitting processes. Any permit that is issued to industry has to go through the National Fund, and the fund has five main areas. One for training and capacity, one for research, uh, for monitoring, equipment, and education. So we're able to source funding from this fund through the board to the minister. And then we'll be able to get that. And this fund is not only for EPA. In the institution in the country that has any role to play, can apply and get that. But of late, what we are seeing is that the government says all of us should have to pay ourselves in taking it of the government's subvention. Now the fund who should contribute into it. And where is the funding coming from? That's where the long-term challenge is also coming in. So now a time will be coming, resources that we were getting from the funding, because we are of the government's subvention, we are paying ourselves as well as also trying to monitor and implement, also do the public good in terms of uh, giving out to the public. The, the resources will become very, very challenging for us. So that's some of the things that we're looking at in the future and try to strengthen our partnership with our external, um, how do you call it, um, folks so that we can work together not to share and take up all the burden, but at least we can work together to share the burden. I think I had been down uh, from your talk as well, uh, requires higher commitment to ensure continuity. And I think, uh, yeah, thanks for expounding on that. That's yeah. very interesting and helpful. Yeah. Um, could, uh, could you introduce yourself? Next question? Yes. Um, my name is Mohamed Ayub. I'm uh, from the Qatar Foundation. Uh, my question is to the sustainability of uh, these types of efforts. Say, I, these low cost centers are low cost. We're talking about one, two, three, but when you're talking about building networks going beyond three, four, five, um, I suspect that you would be surprised at the cost associated with the operation, maintenance, and maintaining the quality of the data. Um, that said, could affect the funding agency, whether it's EPA or, or UN environment and so on. Who is working on feasibility assessment? I mean, unless you want to go into a monster effort like what's happening in Madrid, um, who is looking at the feasibility and long-term sustainability of these efforts, specifically as relates to low- and middle-income countries? Because of this surprise factor that's going to happen after a couple of months, when you look everything is required to go into keeping and maintaining these, these, these networks. Um, is there a sweet spot? Is anybody looking at what is the optimal um, number? <laughs> and, and I'm looking at these on the No, um, thanks for the question. You know, we haven't done the feasibility. What we're doing is really looking at strategies on scale, scalability. You know, one of the things we've been doing wrong, I think, is when we, we when we discuss this, we look at the monitoring instrument and the capacity needs. But if we can make a strong linkage with the whole utility and the policy side and the impact of that intervention, it, it, 
the monitoring cost is really low. Uh, for instance, if you if you you say this monitoring instrumentation is going to result in um, improved taxation on imports of used vehicles or stricter um, uh, limits on on uh, on pollution levels and so on and so forth, and we make that linkage with, and that means economically, this is what you're going to save. I think you'll find that the, the cost in terms of, of, uh, of human health and so on, and I'm talking here of health cost, um, will we'll see a benefit for patients. And that's the angle we are trying to approach. If we focus it just in a segment on the cost of the instrument times these number of instruments and the life of the sensor times replacement cost and so on, I think we're going to fall into what history has shown um, with the regular instruments because they're just, they're just expensive to acquire. Um, so that that's that's at least how we we've, we've approached or we are approaching it. <coughs> so yeah, I mean that's, that's good. I understand that part. Uh, the, the the concern that I have is uh, you know if you're looking at it from human health uh, perspective and you're looking at costing air pollution in X location, uh, whether it's in the form of hospitalization, early mortality, morbidity, loss, productivity, and so on. Sure, but um, the point that I'm trying to get to here is that if unless you're prepared to pay for this in perpetuity it's it, it's not realistic to kind of sell this as as a low-cost sensor venture um, because it's just something that's, that's that it, it, it'll work for you know funding research projects but it, it's not going to work uh, in terms of a long-term effort i mean uh, uh, so so the one thing that I wanted to say is, I mean, so Sean's right, I mean, I don't, I mean, we haven't done sort of feasibility studies, uh, you know, like specifically looking at that or uh, in terms of, uh, but basically going by experience, this is what, what, what works for us. And uh, in that sense, the reason I was happy to take the French funding was because they have an atmospheric deposition network program in some countries of Western Africa. Where they collect uh, passive samples and they collect uh, aerosol measurements, and so they have some local partners there who can be relied upon to help maintain those sensors. Uh, so I think having that local capacity is key. The question is challenges. You know, how do you how does a local government fund that? And it seems like they have found a solution. Maybe uh, the I think one of the things also is to show that it can be done in the first place. Uh, because uh, in Rwanda, there wasn't any air quality monitoring before NPR, for example. And then we went in over the last year and we deployed three or four ramps. Uh, we didn't have a reference monitor. So, you know, when you talk about low cost monitors, I think the key is you're missing a $100,000 piece of reference monitoring equipment that you need to calibrate the sensors locally. And then that's not included in the low cost. And you need two or three technicians who can actually spend their time maintaining those sensors and then also maintaining the low cost monitors around. Uh, the government of Rwanda has actually done this investment. I think it might have been with World Bank funding or something like that. But they have, they have bought reference monitors. They have two or three trained technicians. Uh, Jimmy Kasur has got his PhD from MIT, went back to Rwanda, and now he's faculty at the University of Rwanda. But again, uh, and so he's leading that effort. So their goal is to actually, based on the experience of the ramps, they have bought a set of ramps for their own network. So the way they're setting it is they're having a Think of a hub and spoke model, for example. They have the central reference monitoring site, and then they, which probably will be at Medio Rwanda or something like that. And then they will have, uh, and the equipment is still stuck at Customs Florida here. So let's see. Uh, but eventually, they go there and be deployed, and they will have eight or 10 ramps that are collocated for the calibration and then deployed to the surrounding areas around Kidali. Uh, but they are thinking in terms of that, they have run the you know, the, the, the GAW site in Mozambique. So they have two or three great technicians, but again, this comes back to, you know, some government seeing that, yes, this can be done. This is what it takes to make it happen. And then these are the people we need. This is the investment we need to make. And how can we get that to happen? So, uh, but I think it's, I think in each country will have to have its own experience. I think just some sort of pilot study to show how it can be done. Yeah, just real quick. Um, can I give you two examples of where I think the approach is, is promising? One is um, 
the IWAF, which is the International Association for like FIFA, but for athletes, um, they've jumped onto this where in the next five years they want to deploy um, sensors in all of their stadiums. And where do we see this? It's, it's a it's a catalytic act. They get something out of it in terms of PR, but the local authorities um, get sensors and, and a network to support that through that intervention. So that's one experiment that from from the strategy we're, we're taking um, uh, is, is materializing. The other example is we're trying to monetize this. Um, so I think there's money to be made. In, in Kenya, for example, the National Environmental Management Authority, so the government of the US EPA, but for Kenya, their only source of revenue is from fines. So the use of, of this uh, technology to identify hotspots and, and, and they just got the mobile lab working and then backed it up with a, with a reference grade instrumentation um, is something they would like to use to generate revenue um, to sustain and grow that network. And then, okay. Oh, no, 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 wait a minute. We've been saying no. <laughs> I apologize for, for um, monopolizing the discussion. But with, res with respect to um, you know, regulatory applications and, and anything that requires the test, the legal test, I don't think sensors are at the point where they can actually stand up in court and say, you know, you haven't exceeded this before. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, John, for your thoughts and great conversation. My question is based on your domestic, national, international world. If you heard about, or to what extent this uh, um, inequality is considered not only from a um, human health or public health perspective, but also from a public security and safety perspective or national security perspective in the sense that you want to you can monitor all these pollutants but how this one plays into let's say countering terrorism so you can identify hot spots but those emissions can be done by somebody else or maybe planning a terrorist attack somewhere so so have you heard any any topics with any political discussion, any collaboration with like intelligence community or you know national security agencies that you are know, thinking to address this issue? Thank you. I'm not familiar with that. Is there anyone in our green people? Just green people. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the I think I mean the US Army Lab does some aerosol research. And I mean, and I think there are people who study things like anthrax. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, anthrax is like an aerosol, right? I mean, you're going to spray the powder. And if you study aerosol science, you know, it kind of helps you determine dispersion models and things like that. But that's not the same as the pollutants, for example, that we are measuring, uh, you know, anthrax or whatever other bio, you know, weapon that might be that can be aerosolized that has a different chemical signature. And you definitely do not want to scare people into thinking it's you know some fire weapon when it's actually dust. Um, maybe we could Just all this discussion about cost, there is a magic moment in which the people rise up and say air pollution is not okay anymore, and then everything becomes possible because the politicians have to respond to that demand when it becomes loud enough. And that is in fact Beijing's story. And this uh, set of uh, comments and questions is directed at Professor Liu. Um, you get, oh, sorry, Catherine Witherspoon with the Climate Works Foundation, formerly with the California Air Resources. Um, you gave me a pang of conscience sitting over there listening to your presentation. I did not know that you were providing real-time pollutant data to your inspectors and law enforcement and moving on it that quickly. Um, and that is something that the Western world has not done and should be doing um, in light of the kinds of session we had this morning of communities throughout the United States and sure throughout Europe who were beset every day and they're ignored by the regulatory agencies and say, no, it's not on our monitors, it's not there, it's below detection limits. But whenever we put monitors out, it is there. 
uh, whenever we analyzed the refineries, their emissions are five times higher than we assume. So I want to ask you a question. What was the unit cost of those micro sensors? How often have you had to replace them? And, and what was the secret to managing all that data? Do you have uh, proprietary software? Did someone make it for you? Is it open source? Can you share it with the rest of the world? So that other people can act upon data immediately. Um, when they see something, and, and I beg to differ, you don't need um, reference level monitoring data to take all the actions that are within public officials' ability to take. Um, they certainly can go look, and then if they need to, conduct a source test. But if Mr. Wu could address those questions, I think that you have like, thrown down a gauntlet to the rest of the world, and that we should be following your lead. Do uh, this data analysis in John collaboration with IBM. So, IBM. Yeah. yeah. So, they are have a uh, negotiation and discussion. Uh -huh. And yeah. so far, I find I know the data is not available, not readily available to the community. To the, uh, that's John developed by them and we met him. But I don't know the answer for the other one, I'm sure. Okay, okay. So, okay. This is the Yeah. Uh, the mic? Yeah. Yeah. And then can you say more about the software? Your colleague explained that IBM developed it. Um, and whether or not it's proprietary, if other people can buy the processing system, because getting all that data into a usable format is hard. So, uh, is that possible? <laughs> okay, well, okay, you can tell her. <laughs> So thank you again for presenting today. Um, it's impressive what Beijing, it was impressive two years ago, it's still impressive today. My question is, you're doing it for PM 2.5, are you going to do it for other, the microenvironment sensor monitoring for additional pollutants? Ozone and O2, PM10, VOCs, anything else? So, at this point, uh, only particular matter, and they have planned next year to include photo uh, uh, VOCs and not with sensors. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, for the T VOC sensor, some of have been deployed by uh, a couple of companies in China. Now, in the exhibition, I saw also a friend, 
like this. This type of sentence. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think the I think so. One is I mean I think the cost of course since it's like two thousand dollars, it seems it's pretty high for a not quite a low cost sensor, I guess. But maybe that's the price for the kind of data quality that you need. Uh, but the other point that I like to make, and I think the model where you have the mobile lab, for example, with reference monitors, uh, actually really helps because think about a city that you know you can have. Two sets of reference monitors. One that's a fixed site for to calibrate your local sensors, and then you put out a dense network. And uh, uh, you know, I would, as, uh, as someone told me, more from the low cost team and just say high density spatial network because that ends up adding cost anyway. But so you have high density of lower cost sensors that you deploy, and anytime you see a hotspot, for example. Uh, you can actually have your mobile lab with reference monitors go to that site, do a characterization, and confirm that report, and then take any action that you need. And that mobile lab could have a mix of gases and you know PM 2.5 and all that that you would need to characterize that location. I think that would be probably a much uh, more feasible way of uh, implementing such networks, and with legal backing as well from the reference monitors. Okay. Uh, me, uh, Jin Kun Jiang from Xinhai University. So, if I may add a comment, it's actually related to the first point we were making. Uh, because Beijing, uh, a lot of areas, they are so big. So, when we use the sensors for regulation or point of view, so we are concerned with data quality. Actually, the way Beijing is using, I think, is very smart. So, they are not using it. When they see the house father, they will send people there. So as soon as you are there, you will you may not even need a mobile technology. You will see what's happening there. So you can you can do something. So previously some of the issue is just with a study hidden area, you don't know where you are going to do the inspection, do the regulation. So I think that's what we can do. Yeah, and I would add that. This idea of a high density network is not just that it's low cost, but it's it's uh, small and doesn't require a lot of power. And so you can put it on top of lots of different buildings or attach it to things that you wouldn't be able to put kind of a reference. You wouldn't be able to build a reference station there. So that's another advantage you know, of that as well. Are there other questions for the panel? Well, just one thing I wanted to, to add, if I may. If we deploy a thousand, we may not need to maintain it. It may be. Um, so not to confuse regulatory, but it may be deployed to serve a purpose and serve that purpose well. And then it can be decommissioned. Uh, an example is if it were to uh, do scenario modeling on before and after uh, on, on, on what the impact of investing in a, in a bus rapid transit system would be. And it serves that purpose, the investment comes, and that's good enough. Because at the end of the day, actually, if everything was well, we wouldn't need to monitor at all. Um, so, so just just to make a point, that for, for some places you may just sustain uh, it, but in many places as, as we grow this, we may not need to sustain it, depending on the, on the use case. I had two separate questions, if that's okay. First, I'm Jenny Quintana from San Diego State University, involved in community air monitoring at the US Mexico border. And I was actually very struck by, I think it was the third from the last speaker. I think that was you that said that the satellite monitoring might underestimate PM concentrations if they peak during the night, which is what we see in the winter at the US Mexico border. And that really made me think about what the panel could comment on. When on the ground, low cost sensors really add value to modeling, to satellite measurements. And when you think about it, that's a perfect case where on the ground monitoring can validate or add value or add an equation to add to satellite measurements and, and make them more accurate. Um, but just in general, where do you see low cost sensing adding value to existing methods? 
So I mean, I think uh, I think I think that's uh, I think looking at these dynamic patterns, for example, or the examples that I showed in terms of um, I think uh, where you already have an existing network, you can. But even when you have an existing network, for example, in Pittsburgh, uh, in Allegheny County, we have about maybe five HPSPA monitors, we have the platform monitors for the entire county. And so that's a very sparse network. So about, I think it was a population of Allegheny County, like a million people. And so that's about five monitors, continuous period to point five. The others are filter based, you know, you get the data later on. Uh, but in terms of, and if you know Pittsburgh, I mean, it's a very hilly terrain. There's lots of river valleys, there's industrial facilities, so there can be more local immersions. Uh, that can be areas in the city that are more polluted than the others because of wind patterns. And this is what we are seeing with the high density network. We deployed about 50 nodes in an area where there were two, uh, two reference period 2.5 monitors. We had 50 of our monitors. And you can actually see these spatial gradients in the entire city. And you can identify periods when uh, you know, one area is more polluted than the other. Uh, you know, Mark is sitting back there and he, you know, he always talks about the stink bird and you know, smell and that's an obvious reason, but the you know, low cost PM sensors actually give you a way to quantify that. Uh, the, near the US-Mexico border, I know of some projects like Ivan, for example, in Beetle Valley, who are deploying these low cost monitors and they're getting a lot of big data out of it and uh, that's another area. And I recently learned that there are lots of tribal lands that don't have any air quality monitoring, uh, and that can be like entire states without an ozone monitor, for example. <laughs> so those are again some areas where you could conceivably a community group could get together, buy a low cost monitor, get it calibrated, maybe go to the university or something like that, and start collecting data. Uh, but I mean, those would be some of the examples that I would think of, especially in the U.S. or uh, you know, in Mexico and other places. I can add to this. Uh, internationally, one of the areas where it can add uh, tremendous value is if we if we look at satellite uh, estimates for PM 2.5 using aerosol optical depth um, methods, where you have levels of high uncertainty, um, it's, it's where we can deploy sensors to, to help um, validate um, the accuracy of, of those measurements. And if you look at the combination, and that's something, I didn't talk about it, but something we're excited to embark on now um, for Africa is, is to see how we can use this approach of, of ground observations, including sensor-based um, values with the aerosol optical depth information. Thank you. Second question is much more practical. Um, and many of you are making uh, measurements of particulate in very high humidity environments, which is difficult. So when it came to the sensor meeting, I was hoping to see a tiny solar cheap inlet dryer that would dry the particles going to the machine, which would help a lot with, you know, getting rid of humidity effects. Um, I saw some people like TSI, I think, had a box you could stick your instrument in and would do inlet drying. But, um, how do you deal with the effects of super high humidity, which is very hard to correct for? And I guess my question was also for the Beijing data. How did you correct for the effects of humidity um, when you have these sensor networks? Especially if it's very high humidity, it's difficult. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, when you have a, a cheap air sensor, we need some time uh, correction. Because uh, and for us, when we, we have an air sensor, we, we take measure with the, the fixed station and see the data and compare the data. Uh, and as we don't uh, take for the cheaper, we take for the good quality. That's for interesting for us and. Always, we are asking for um, the calibration certificate is here because uh, sometimes when we are doing uh, the measurement, uh, the guy asks us where is uh, the certificate or so the calibration certificate. Uh, so, uh, I mean, the more uh, to your question. So we actually used a couple of different types of PM monitors. 
uh, one is a metro neighborhood PM monitor, which has a uh, you know, PM 2.5 cyclone and inlet heater to take to correct for to correct for the intended to correct for the humidity artifact or aerosol, for example, and then the sensor. The second one is a purple air, which is basically two plant tower sensors plugged inside a plastic end cap. Uh, the what I've found is that the purple air seems to be less affected by humidity than the red one. And uh, I think I was talking to uh, Liam and Kaitara, we were hand Liam. Uh, and so he has worked a lot with the plant tower sensors working in the manufacturer. And he tells me that it's basically because in the sensor, the air is drawn over the electronic circuits. and the laser is hot, so it basically warms up the air, so you reduce some of the humidity artifacts. That would be sort of an uh, you know unintended way of correcting of reducing the humidity artifact if you will. We still have to do corrections before composition size distribution and so on and so forth. But in terms of you know, you said let's have a little cheap uh, solar powered heater to reduce the humidity artifact. Now the met one and neighborhood be a monitor. Uh, is uh, so we do have a few low cost monitors deployed, uh, especially in Puerto Rico, which are powered by solar panels. But they all use purple air PM monitors. Uh, the reason for that is that the MET one, which has the inlet heater, cannot be run on a reasonably feasible solar panel. It draws about, I think, when the heater is turned on, I think the sensor itself takes about, I think, five or 10 watts, but the heater takes about 30 or 40 watts. And when you're planning a solar panel for to support that, you're thinking of something that's like a 300 watt solar panel, which is not, you know, not strong and difficult. And you can easily, like my ramps run on a 30 watt solar panel with a purple air. And so, so to sort of, uh, you know, say the alternative would be to do that approach with a 30 watt solar panel with a purple air, which seems to have this built in humidity correction. And, you know, your home. So that's basically what I would suggest. Uh, but beyond that, you still have to do all sorts of corrections to the data anyway, because the you know the manufacturers may have calibrated it at their factory yeah. with a particular aerosol. And the aerosol composition and the size distribution in the area where it deployed is can be quite different from where it was in the factory. So some sort of local correction, calibration, collocation with filter-based methods is always required if you want good quality data. Yes, we already do that in our study to be clear. We have elaborate calculation equations, but I'm just thinking when you start deploying 1,500 of these monitors, especially in AG, you know, how did you deal with the effect of humidity um, when you're having real-time hotspots? Because ours was corrected online and then displayed to the community, but a lot of monitors go directly to the community and they don't go through the complicated equations first. Yeah. So I think the so the purple air network, for example, initially for a long time was presenting data without any corrections. And I think recently you have an option to have a correction to the University of Utah. Uh, but we also been talking to the Adrian and the people there about using our own corrections which are developed in Pittsburgh, which actually sees a lot of humidity variability and all that, and trying to incorporate that into the real time map. And at the end of the day, if you see a hot spot that needs, you know, like 200 microns of humidity over 2.5, what's the humidity artifact that will be like a factor of three, you still have a 70 micron per meter cube level anyway. Right? So maybe that is a hot spot that people need, you know, you don't, you don't want to breathe in that level of 2.5. So I mean, that sounds like a facetious way of saying it, but when you see a high level, like, there is something there. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Yeah. 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 You just again another part of your question. If the uh, gentleman from Tsinghua, if you could help with the translation a little bit, if you wouldn't mind. So uh, Adam, I come in first. And then I ask the question. So from technical point of view, uh, I think there are two ways you can do this. But one way is you can design in like which you control the translation to be tested. Some also instrument doing that. Another way is you just like whatever goes to the instrument and you do the do the uh, calibration work we are referring. You can both do the laboratory calibration, also when you deploy in the field. If you happen to have a reference instrument with the with the uh, information, 
you know, other sessions that have been data analysis, they show relatively reasonable improvement with these kind of calibrations. So that's my take on it. Or, or ask question. Hayot 就是你的速度模型是降临了一次之后你就一直都用那个模型 Uh, so based on what he said, for all the sensors before they were deployed, they will do a parallel calibration. That's the first thing they do. And once they are deployed in the field, so there is data communication between the sensor and the between the sensor and the data center they are having. So they will analyze last seven days data, compare the sensor with the reference station, and they will build a uh, rotation minute correction algorithm based on last seven days data. And then this correction algorithm will be sent to the sensor, which was already deployed. So they continue to do this collaboration when the sensor is running. Yeah, and uh, Mr. Rappo was also just telling me that they have very high levels of, of humidity in Ghana as well. And I think that. Um, they're just not at the point yet where they're able to do that reference uh, method to that's coming very soon. And once they have that basic capacity, the reference method compared to the sensors, so they'll be able to push that out better. Um, but it sounds like nobody has the, the solar powered heater in like they're looking for. <laughs> uh, um, are there any other questions? Uh, if not, I want to take one more time to thank all of our speakers uh, for being up here today. So thank you. And much thanks to you for all your interesting questions. Uh, uh, hope you enjoyed the rest of the meeting. Thanks.